I want to uh, say to my colleague from Nebraska, the former governor, now senator from that state, that I am I'm one of the uh, signatures on the letter that he has sent requesting that we get cost data before we move forward with this and what the impact's going to be, because that really is the issue. And I've listened to some of the discussion that's occurred on the floor this morning. Uh, the senator from Illinois was down here earlier, Senator Durbin, talking about uh, the, the, uh, the Republicans are attacking the House bill. Why are they attacking the House bill? Why aren't they talking about the Senate bill? Well, it's very simple. There is no Senate bill. <laughs> it's, it's being written behind closed doors. We've not been included in any of that. We've not been privy to any of the discussions that are occurring behind closed doors. And so when we come down here and talk about health care reform, we are confined to talking about the House passed bill because there isn't a Senate bill. Now, there are two Senate versions that have passed Senate committees. The Finance Committee's passed a bill. The Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee's passed a bill. But the merger of those bills is occurring behind closed doors in direct contradiction of what was promised earlier about health care reform. President Obama said that when we do health care reform, it's going to be an open, transparent process. The American people are going to be able to observe this. In fact, it's going to be done on C-SPAN. Well, anything, nothing could be further from the truth, Mr. President, because it's all happening behind closed doors. And so when we come out here and talk about health care reform, we are left with talking about a House bill because there is no Senate bill. Now, we're told that this week we're going to see it, and I hope that's the case, because we'd love to be able to react to the Senate bill, and we'd love to know what it's going to cost, and the American people would love to know what it's going to cost, and they would also like to have some time to look at it before we start voting on it in the Senate. Now, my understanding is that this is going to be a compressed schedule. They're going to try and get a vote this week on a motion to proceed to the bill, uh, come back right after Thanksgiving and try and rush this through the Senate before the Christmas holiday. A bill that represents one-sixth of the American economy. The House bill, 2,200 pages. 2,200 pages long, and the Republicans were allowed one amendment. One amendment in the House. Well, I think we're going to have to make sure here in the Senate that this gets done right, and that's going to take some time. Now, Mr. President, when the No Child Left Behind legislation was debated in the Senate, it took seven weeks on the floor here. We had an energy bill, a comprehensive energy bill, a few years ago that took eight weeks on the floor of the Senate. The farm bill that passed in the last session of Congress took four weeks on the floor of the Senate. We need to make sure that this gets done in the right way for the American people. And we don't even have a bill yet, and that's why we're down here talking about the bills that we so far are out there. Now, the senator from Illinois also said the main concern the American people have is cost. Costs keep going up. I had a, a, a roundtable in, in my home state in Sioux Falls last week. The governor of my state, Governor Rounds, participated, as did several small business owners. I had a restaurant owner. I had a, a retail a pharmacy, a chain drugstore manager. I had a, a small business owner who manufactures uh, uh, wood products. They were all there, and they're all concerned about the same thing. They're all concerned about cost, and how are we going to be able to provide good coverage to our employer, employees, and what are we going to do if this massive expansion of the federal government, $3 trillion when it's fully implemented, passes, with all the costs that are going to be passed on to business, how are we going to be able to continue to cover our employees? And what is that going to mean for people across this country in terms of coverage? And so I agree with the other side, with the senator from Illinois who was up here earlier saying that cost is the issue. People care about cost. That's what I care about. That's what the people in my state of South Dakota care about, is how do we get the, insurance, the cost for health care and health care coverage down in this country. Well, the ironic thing about all these bills so far that we've seen, none of them, none of them do anything to get cost down. All of them increase costs. And so the so-called curve that we talk about, bending the cost curve down, isn't happening under any of these bills. Now, we haven't seen, as I said, the Senate bill because it's still written, being written behind closed doors, but the House passed bill, the 2,200-page monstrosity that passed the House of Representatives earlier, and the Senate bills that we've seen so far that have been produced by committees all have the same basic characteristics about them. The first is they raise taxes, and they raise taxes substantially, and they raise taxes contrary, again, in a contradiction of promises made by the president on people making less than $200,000 and people making less than $100,000. And in fact, because the individual mandate in the House passed bill, 
people making $22,800 $22, a year and up to $68,400 a year are going to see a huge tax increase that's going to hit them. Small businesses, because of the pay-or-play mandate, which supposedly under the House bill raises $135 billion, are going to see their taxes go up. And the so-called high-income earners, $500,000 and above, are going to see their taxes go up because there's going to be a surtax applied to high-income earners. The problem with that is it just doesn't hit high-income earners. It hits small businesses who happen, because of the way they're organized, is as subchapter S corporations or LLCs to file on their individual tax returns. And the CBO has said that one-third of the tax increases that are targeted at the so-called rich are going to hit small businesses, which are the job creators in our economy. The engine of economic recovery in America, three-quarters of, jo of our jobs, at least they say two-thirds or three-quarters of jobs in this country are created by small businesses, and we're going to raise taxes on them. And in fact, the highest marginal income tax rate, if this thing passes uh, next year with the expiration of tax cuts that were enacted in 2001 and 2003, is going to go from 35% to 46.4%. That's the highest marginal income tax rate that we've seen in 25 years. And it's going to hit squarely small businesses that we're relying on to try and get us out of this recession and to create jobs. And so this thing is all financed with higher taxes. It's financed with Medicare cuts. That's the other, I talked about the, the characteristics that are consistent with regard to all these proposals. Uh, you've got higher taxes. You've also got Medicare cuts to the tune of half a trillion dollars a year, which as my colleagues have already pointed out earlier this morning, are really going to hit, um, you know, not only providers, but also seniors. Medicare Advantage program uh, seniors who take advantage of that are going to see their benefits cut. And so you've got the individuals impacted, the providers impacted, and of course you've got most Americans are going to be impacted in one way, form, or another by these tax increases. But the final point I want to make, Mr. President, because it's the most important one in all this, and that is that the other characteristic that these plans all have in common, in addition to higher taxes and Medicare cuts, is higher health care costs, higher premiums. The, the uh, CMS actuary that just came out uh, last week the, uh, with a report that described the House pass bill says that it's going to increase the cost of health care in this country by $289 billion. We spend about 17% of our GDP today on health care under that bill that passed in the House of Representatives. That would go up to 21.1%. If we did nothing, we would be better off in terms of the costs that are going to be passed on to people in this country in the form of higher health care uh, expenses. And so it said very plainly that we're going to see increased costs. It also said that we're going to see the chief actuary concluded that 12 million people would lose their employer-sponsored coverage because smaller employers would be inclined to terminate coverage so their workers would qualify for heavily subsidized coverage through the exchange. Now, the biggest number of people that are going to get covered under the bill are going to get covered because they're going to be pushed into Medicaid which, uh, under this proposal, does expand significantly the number of people who are eligible for Medicaid. The problem with that, of course, is that that pass on enormous cost to the states. You heard the governor, former governor of Nebraska talk about that, the former governor of Tennessee, Senator Alexander, talk about that. My governor, uh, Senator, or Governor Rounds in South Dakota last week, looked, said that we're going to be faced with $134 million in increased cost to the states to pay for this because Medicare is a partnership between the states and the federal government. And so you're, 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 the, any, any benefit that we get, about 60% of the people who are going to get coverage because of this bill are going to get it through Medicaid uh, at an enormous additional cost to the states, which is going to be passed on to taxpayers in the individual states around this country. And so you've got higher taxes on small businesses. You've got higher taxes on individuals. You've got Medicare cuts that are going to impact seniors and providers. And the amazing thing about all this is you're going to have higher health care costs when it's all said and done. Remarkable, remarkable that health care reform could be, that anything could be called health care reform that raises costs in the way that these proposals would do. Now, finally, I would say in response to what the other side has said is that the Republicans don't have alternatives. Wrong again. Republicans have consistently supported and, and proposed 
step-by-step solutions that would do this and do it right so that it does drive down the cost of health care, interstate competition, allowing people to buy insurance across state lines, allowing people to join small business health plans that give them the, the advantage of group purchasing power and thereby drive down the cost of health insurance. Senator, the, the time Court has reform. expired for morning business. We have a whole range of things that we hope to have an opportunity to get to, but before we can do that, we've got to defeat this $3 trillion monstrosity. Mr. President, I yield the floor.